Bienvenue, mi ami. Today we are at one of the most famous paintings in the entire world. I think many would be hard pressed to name or even a second famous painting because this, ladies and gentlemen, is Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. The one with the mysterious smile and the mysterious origins. Also, the star of the greatest art heist in all of history. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist. Today we're going to walk around one of the most famous museums in all of the world. This is the Louvre in France, in Paris. This is a gigantic mega museum with countless artworks. We're not going to be able to see most of them but we're gonna see a few highlights the very very famous ones and then we'll venture outside to catch the exterior of the Louvre but I'm so hyped to show you the Mona Lisa in live video let me know where you're watching from let me know what's your favorite painting in the world have you seen the Mona Lisa in person well you're about to be in luck But first, I gotta give you a little bit of context. And I think I gotta give you context into a common misconception. Hello, Inspire Live. You say uh, you have goosebumps. Oh, I'm so glad you do. Mirav says, where is this? This is in the Louvre Museum in Paris, which is right in the center of Paris. Basically, the exact geographic center of Paris, give or take. But this painting was the true star before the Mona Lisa ever became famous. The Mona Lisa really became famous in the early 1900s. We'll get to why. But this, before the 1900s, was known as the most beautiful painting in the world. It is the wedding at Cana, the wedding feast at Cana, made by Paolo Veronese. It depicts Jesus Christ with his disciples, turning water into wine at the wedding feast. But this was a plunder of war. It was taken from the Italians during Napoleon's conquest of the peninsula. Napoleon did not only mean to conquer Italy via political means, via military, via land acquisition, he also wanted to conquer the culture. He wanted to take the culture, which he thought was in decrepit circumstances in native Italy, and bring it back to France so he can host it here in his wonderful Louvre Museum, which he actually lived in for a According to Napoleon, this painting right here, among many others, over 500 taken in total, were in terrible, dire circumstances in the worst places in Italy. How dare the Italians, quote unquote, let this artwork go to waste? Well, you know, that's more... Napoleon was a little bit exaggerated because this was located at the monastery of San Giorgio. And when they wanted to take it out, to the wall. So they had first had to rip it out. And when they ripped it out, nails shattered all around the floor of the monastery. They ruined the corners of the paints. Okay. Okay, so they can fix that. I think this spot might be one of those corners. Let me show it to you. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe there's a docent that will let me know. But right here in this corner, I think this might be... If you see it's a little bit faded out, that might be one of the corners where the nails were. Okay, so they ruined the corners, but most of the paint and canvas is still intact. But then they figured that there was no way in hell that they were able to transport this gigantic painting compared to the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is tiny compared to this one. There was no way in hell that they could transport this back to France. And then they tried ripping out the canvas and they found out that it was extremely hard to do so, especially intact. So they had a genius idea. 
Let me know what you think that genius idea is. We can see the marking right over here. Their genius idea was to rip this painting in half and then reassemble it back here in Paris. Oh, uh, well, that ruined the painting any further. And uh, they destroyed the painting in order to, quote unquote, save the painting. So why am I telling you this story? A, it's actually cool on its own. But B, it's related to the woman who stole the show a hundred years later, the Mona Lisa. There was an Italian national by the name of Vincenzo Perugia. We're gonna get closer to it soon. But let me tell you the story first. Vincenzo Perugia, Italian national, August 1911, was actually helping preserve a lot of the paintings here. He ended up making the glass work and working on the team that would put glass in front of the different paintings around the Louvre. One of those paintings that he helped uh, put glass in was in the same section of the Renaissance that the Mona Lisa was located in. Vincenzo Perugia was a very proud Italian. He came over here to Paris, which did not accept them too much. Parisians really didn't like the Italians coming over here same thing happened in New York initially. So he thought to himself, they stole this painting from our dear Italy. Let me bring it back. He thought, and uh, Mandy says there's a kid following me. Yeah, there, indeed, indeed uh, uh, there is a kid uh, <laughs> overhearing my story. There was a, um, he wanted to bring it back. He thought that this was one of the paintings, and someone's blocking it right now, but right behind this, he thought that the Mona Lisa was one of the paintings stolen by Napoleon. No. <laughs> it was here hundreds of years ago. Leonardo even painted it. It came here to Paris. So he was wrong. It was army. And retrieved. And he only got a light one-year sentence. But why is the Mona Lisa so mysterious? Why does it captivate so many people? That art heist is one of the main reasons. Let's get closer to it. Now this one is actually one of more than 500 from Italy and brought over here to the Louvre. Half of them were brought back. Let's go this way. So, thankfully, the line is not insanely long. Uh, like I came here back in 2019, tourism is still not 100%. I don't think uh, a lot of Chinese tourists are coming yet, Japanese either, or Korean, so um, it's still pretty light. James says it's by, it's by Paolo Veronese. Indeed it is. <laughs> Joyce says, when are you going to talk about the Netherlands? Oh, if I go to the Netherlands, I'll talk about the Netherlands. How much is the Mona Lisa bolted at? So it's just saying, how much is it? Uh, you know, uh, I think it was a... Uh, a hundred years ago, don't quote me on this, I'm saying off the top of my head, I think it was valued at like a hundred million dollars, something more than a, hundred, a few hundred million dollars, which would be now valued at about more than a billion. But that was the valuation back in the early 1900s. Um, I think it pretty much is priceless. I don't think there's a value with the Mona Lisa. Marianne says, That's, this is a light crowd. Oh, yes. In the meanwhile, I'll show you more of the paintings that surround it as we're waiting. Justine says, I'll take it. Take it for a, a cool one billion. Probably not worth a billion now. James says, I think if they auction the Mona Lisa, it would be worth billions. Yes, it would be.
Athena says, hey, long time. I was there a few times, saw the Mona Lisa. She was still smiling, oh, luckily. Wendy says, please don't do a heist. No, no heist will be involved in this live stream. Marianne says, I saw the Mona Lisa back in New York when it was at the Met. <laughs> you know, funnily enough, uh, that's cool, awesome. Let me know what year that it was. That probably was a few decades ago. Uh, but as I mentioned, the Mona Lisa was stolen by a worker here at the Louvre. He actually hid in the closet overnight on a very hot and humid day, so he probably was super sweaty. He wore uh, these white smocks that the restorers of paintings would wear. And he came just in the early morning before the Louvre opened, took disassembled the the frame took it down only an expert would have need, uh, known how to take it down rolled it up and took it with him underneath his shirt a guard even let him out he was stuck in one of the doors but the guard thought he was just a worker he was just a worker and just let him out wasn't any suspicious and then when they found out that the wall was missing a painting the workers thought Ah, uh, well, maybe maybe they took it for restoration. Maybe they took it to photograph. It'll be okay. Then the day passes, <laughs> and it's still not back. And that's when uh, the museum started panicking because they realized that one of their most prized paintings was stolen. So, it was stolen. There was a massive manhunt underway. The guy who actually um, talked... Of the, the guy who actually stole it was questioned initially. He was one of the first sus suspects. But they thought that he wasn't responsible because, you know, he was just a worker. He said that he got super drunk, came late to work, and they believed him. So one of the main suspects actually ended up being Pablo Picasso. Yep, the famous painter of abstract cubist art and one of his main friends. The reason they even blamed Picasso in the first place was because he actually stole, well, apparently, and a lot of people say this with good confidence, you can find many articles online, he stole a sculpture that was here inside the Louvre with this friend. However, Picasso was so freaked out that he claimed that he never knew this other guy. This other guy was already boasting that he stole a bunch of stuff from the Louvre. However, they found out that neither that guy nor Picasso was responsible for stealing the Mona Lisa. And he was let out. So two years underwent and they finally had retrieved the painting. Vincenzo Perugia thought he was going to be the savior of Italy, but the Italian government arrested him. And they gave it back to France. And now we have it here. Because of this entire scandal, that actually coincided around the same time when the Titanic uh, went down, it was big news. And that's one of the main reasons why it became so famous. Right here, we're so close to it. The enigmatic Mona Lisa is under cake proof, I mean bulletproof glass. We'll see if her eyes move.
to the front. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Alright, here we are. I'm going to take a selfie. <laughs> yeah? And one more close up look. Oh, look at that. Wow. So there's an entire mistiness around the entire painting. It actually helps blend in the background and the foreground elements. And those elements. Uh, that actual fogginess is what made the Mona Lisa so captivating compared to many Renaissance paintings because a lot of Renaissance paintings had a lot more sharpness to it. So every element looked very distinct, almost like if uh, you take a photo with deep focus and way too high sharpness. Um, Leonardo da Vinci ended up basically in modern terms making a more cinematic portrait. Okay, time to move. Oh, that's kind of cool. That's amazing. Cynthia says, was that a side eye she just gave you? Yeah, she gives everyone the side eye. Mona Lisa, you know, very, very... Call you a very sassy woman. Ruben says, up close and personal. I think this is the closest I've been because... Uh, I think they put the tape a little bit closer this time. Uh -huh. Ashley says that was a trip. Really? Oh, oh. Indeed, it was. Yes. Uh, clutch, catch one more glimpse. Let's see it from the side. So one of the main theories, and this is a pretty well-known one, is that she was pregnant. That's why she has her hands in that stance. Apparently the real woman was Lisa Giocondo, who was the wife of a merchant, middle-class merchant in Italy. Um, so it was very strange to learn da Vinci who worked with some of the richest people in Italy and in Europe end up making a such a beautiful portrait for a middle class family probably with very little commission and that's one of the many mysteries when it comes to the Mona Lisa the other mystery is he kept it so he actually never gave it to the Giocondo family apparently and he had it with him till his late age and no one really knows why but then there's another mystery And let's move out. James says she was rich. She was not rich. I mean, she was, a, she was well, she had some wealth. She had some wealth from what I've read. It's almost like saying that person in your middle-class suburban neighborhood that has a mansion, you wouldn't call them necessarily super wealthy. Uh, but probably not enough to hire someone like Da Vinci, unless if there was some type of personal connection or something else. 
Uh, of course, that is all speculation. We don't truly know. But the other interesting thing is that shortly thereafter, one of Da Vinci's disciples uh, painted a replica of Mona Lisa. But that replica had a difference. Let me see if you can the Mona Lisa. I have it here. Here it is. Um, something look off to you? This, this was meant to be a copy of the Mona Lisa shortly after Leonardo's death. And uh, these painters did not mess around. They did not make up stuff. This was like a hard Da Vinciite. <laughs> What do you see? Different. Cynthia says uh, Da Vinci used a male model. That could be, yeah. And that wasn't out of the question. Uh, if you can find the model at hand, you would just uh, use a male model or yourself as a model. So that could have been. So yeah, this woman that was painted shortly after Da Vinci's death as a rep is different. It's behind her, that's number one. There's a small cityscape behind her, a village. Um, she has a headband. She has more significant eyebrows. She looks younger. Someone just mentioned she has a cleft chin, kind of has a cleft chin. Um, and many other differences. This is not the same Mona Lisa. Then, many decades ago, they actually found a very interesting painting. It was a man called Islesworth who found this Mona Lisa. This is not the same Mona Lisa. This is apparently the Islesworth Mona Lisa, what people call it now. This is apparently the second Mona Lisa. This is hidden deep in a art vault in Zurich, Switzerland. I'm not sure if it's been moved recently, but many people believe that this is indeed an original Da Vinci that is also a second one. I'm really glad that they have uh, accessible viewing for people with uh, mobility issues. That's, that's awesome. So everyone, if you have mobility issues, um, I'm not sure what they would consider mobility issues. Definitely, I see a wheelchair. Uh, they'll allow you to get a little bit closer. So it's a cool, cool perk. So that has puzzled people for decades already at this point. That second Mona Lisa is very highly valued. Uh, there's a documentary on the BBC that talks about them trying to sell it, and price tag is well into the tens of millions or hundreds of millions. So is that a real, uh, real Mona Lisa? And why is there a second Mona Lisa? And why is she younger? One of the main theories was that it was not Lisa Giocondo. That younger one was a Medici. Lisa Giocondo uh, at two different ages. So let's continue walking around and show you more of the majesty of the Louvre. I'm going to show you just a few highlights. Wow, the ceiling is breathtaking.
wondering about accessibility, there's a lot of elevators all throughout the museum. There's ramps as well. This is the gift shop. I'll show you briefly. Let me show you the ones of Perugia right over here. This is a screenshot. And a lot of people say that Da Vinci actually used his likeness either entirely or <laughs> people talked about the brow, that the brow is very similar to Da Vinci. Another theory is that it was actually his lover. And uh oh, I don't want to be demonetized for this photo, uh, but I'll show it. Zoom in very quickly. There we go. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Salai. Salai apparently was a very long time companion of Da Vinci. No one really knows what the nature of their companionship was. Wife? So no one. which he actually already did a sketch of, painting Salai in a very feminine way. So right here he is. Salai actually ended up getting married, but Salai had a lot more rumors of him being actually gay. So there's going to be a little bit of shaky cell phone reception because there's so many people here. Hopefully it holds up for just a little bit more. Robin says, what a wonderful tour. Thank you for taking me inside. My pleasure. I'm so happy I can take you inside to see the Mona Lisa uh, virtually. I know many people uh, are unable to travel for a myriad of reasons. So I'm glad I can at least bring you virtually to one of the most famous paintings and one of the most famous museums in the world. So if anyone asked the question earlier, feel free to ask again. <laughs> I was deep in storytelling mode and dodging hordes of selfie takers. So Susie says, uh, do you think you'll miss a painting if you help yourself? Susie, I'm so happy you mentioned that. Pablo Picasso and his friend, um, they were known to tell, at their very young age, they were known to tell friends, oh, I'm going to the Louvre. Do you want anything? As I mentioned, it was because most likely, Pablo Picasso stole a sculpture, if not something else, uh, more. So, uh, what I, what would I want at home if I could <laughs> have it legally, of course? Um, it's a good question. I would have the winged statue, uh, the winged N Nike of Samithrace, or Nike of Samithrace. Uh, let's see if we can find it. That is one of the most beautiful sculptures I've ever seen in my life. Let's continue walking around. Justine says, I love Monet. Yes. Monet is awesome. There's a beautiful museum close to here that shows uh, gigantic work from Monet. Well, let's see the most famous painting in this collection. Right over here. You ever seen the film? or the Broadway musical Les Mis, Les Miserables. 
or, or dared to read the gigantic tome of a book by Victor Hugo. Well, this painting reminds me of that Broadway musical. This is a famous painting of the French Revolution made by Delacroix. It's almost like a Lady Liberty. But um, she's exposing herself. Cue the music by Les Mis. Red is the color of angry men. Who dreams a little dream? Let me know. Decraw, Decraw, thank you so much, Decraw. Justine says, I would love to see these paintings come to life in the night of the museum type of movie. Yeah, that would be cool. The Night at the Louvre. That would be awesome. Susie says, there was a lot of cleavage uh, back then. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I think it was in, in mode. It was on trend. Ooh, I like this one. What is this? This one's cool. This is, ooh, interior of the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi, which I visited, but I couldn't live stream inside because they didn't allow video. Um, this is made by Francois Marouet Granet. Granet. John says, will you also visit the Museo de Orsay? If I do, it will be a Patreon exclusive. So become a patron to get access to museums like the Orsay. It might be the Orsay uh, itself. Stay tuned, patrons. Patreon.com slash urbanist. Wendy says, write it right on the back and send it as a postcard. Yeah. Can we see more ceilings, says uh, Janice. My pleasure. I'll show you all the ceilings. Jorge says, I love everything you do. Great job. I'm in Puerto Rico. Oh, bienvenidos, Jorge. Que bien que te encanta estos videos. Wendy says, breathtaking. Wowzers. Oh, yeah. And here's the cafe. Susan says, fantastic, thank you. Do you know if the Germans stole any paintings, says Paul? They, they uh, looted the Louvre. I'm not sure if they actually were successful in bringing it back to Germany. Let me know. Uh, but they certainly did come into the Louvre. There's a few photos of German officers posing right next to the paintings. And the thing is, a lot of people don't know, during World War II, Paris was relatively intact. So, and of German tourists came here because they were absolutely in love with Paris.
gorgeous staircase. Ah, bad service here. Pinky says, uh, Starbucks does not have an impressive ceiling like this. <laughs> no, no, Starbucks, Starbucks does not have a ceiling like this. So this is interesting. If you remember my videos from Rome in 2019, I didn't manage to go last year, but there's this beautiful church that had the final sculpture from Michelangelo. One of them is Moses with two horns on his head. This was made as a tomb for one of the was Pope Innocent X. That tomb was actually unfinished. He intended to have these figures that were called the captives. And they were going to be all along the entire tomb. A few of them. All of them. And here they are. They were very interesting. They were like... Michael, Michelangelo was an interesting artist because towards his very late life, he was already... What, he was 80? 80-something? 80 uh, he ended up innovating. known for making sculpture that was very uh, had lots of movement had lots of life but then other sculptures started coming into the scene that were making even more movement so Michelangelo just took that to a notch up to 11 and made something that was so twist and turny that even the human probably cannot make those shapes so interesting Philo, thank you so much for the $20 super chat. I appreciate you. Philo says, thank you so much for showing those views. The tune was for Pope Julius. Thank you so much for clarifying. Pope Julius. Where's the arch from? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Is there a, a sign? Let's see. There's bad service here, so let me not get figures of Hercules and this was in the Palazzo Stagna, uh, Stanga in, or Stangia in Cremona Italy most likely and this was one of the typical palaces in Lombardy second half of the 15th century wow interesting this was the original so it was just the doorway, <laughs> built in the 1490s. Susie says, is it wrong that I'm staring at this beautiful staircase and not the statue? Not at all. So in recent times, since the invention of the smartphone, there has been a new term coined, the selfie. We selfie comes from antiquity. The very origins of the selfie was right here, with this sculpture, the original selfie.
who knew that who would have known that Instagram was popular back in ancient <laughs> when was this built it's not this one might be this one Oh, this was this pretty recent. In 1670. Of course, I'm joking. <laughs> Instagram, no selfies existed in 1670. Jen! Send a five dollar super chat. Thank you so much. What is she holding? You know, that's a good question. I don't even know. Let's see. That's a good question. He seems to be searching from some cell phone signal. You know, there was very poor signal back in 1670. Wendy says it's a mirror. Yeah, it's a mirror. Let's see what it says on the sheet. But he's trampling a huge serpent. You know, if you defeat a mythical serpent, you got to take a selfie. No pics or pics or it didn't happen, as the old saying goes. So it says Apollo, the god of music and poetry in Greek mythology, has just slain the serpent Python and tramples on the monster's cadaver. He probably once held a bow in his raised left hand, although visibly influenced by the work of Bernini. Ah, cool. Since the precise origin of this statuary group is unknown, it was probably the part of a fountain. So yeah, it wasn't a smartphone. It was just a bow, a very, 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 very big bow, it appears. Ashley says she's holding the iPhone BC. It kind of looks like a she, but it's actually a Apollo. So it's a he. He needs a pedicure. <laughs> he needs a gimbal for that phone. Yeah, I think he does. You know, if he's going to live stream him defeating a mythical serpent. I think he needs a, a gimbal. Wendy says, I think, uh, Ariel, I thought you said bone. No, the bone is underneath the cloak over here. 